What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined, as always, by my brother and the other fantastic host of this show, Nick. And Nick, Steelers week, another week at SoFi, three straight weeks at SoFi. But first and most importantly, how are you, my good brother? I'm good. Uh, keen listeners of Rams Brothers the Pod will know that I didn't have a mustache last week. It's for my inevitable Halloween costume. Um, but yeah, I'm doing good, Dean. I'm doing sure. good. I'm ready. Um, before we get started, I just want to go right off the bat and tell you yeah. about this amazing restaurant. It's, it's the Bruce Hall. It's time to hear about my favorite spot to watch all the games, the Bruce Hall. It's a brewery with food uh, and wall-to-wall screens, TVs, the best staff. They brew and serve Colin Cowherd's The Herd Beer Line. They have a hazy IPA and a Pilsner. I'm, I'm a bigger fan of the Pilsner, but I know Dean would probably lean IPA. Uh, their food is absolutely incredible. We love the spicy chicken sandwich and the poke bowl. Bruce Hall has two locations, one in Torrance and one on the Hermosa Beach Pier. Uh, we couldn't recommend this spot enough. And they're offering free rally fries with purchase. All you got to do is mention the Rams brothers. doesn't have to be just when the Rams are playing. Whenever you want, if you go there, be like, hey, what's up? Rams Brothers sent us, and you get free fries. So check them out on Instagram. Check them out in person at the Bruce Hall. Visit them online at thebrucehall.com, and cheers to them. I thought you were going to give us a spoiler and tell us about your Halloween costume, but you went right into the ad read, so you, you threw me off a tad. I was expecting I mean, a, a spoiler, but I guess you could save it for the big reveal. Comment below and, and you know, let me know who you think I'm going to be for Halloween. I feel like it's kind of obvious, but who knows? right now you look like Arthur Smith. I'm trying to think of other Rams team members or coaches that have just a stash. I will, uh, I guess it, it remains to be seen. All right. For this episode, we are going to do a full preview of the Pittsburgh Steelers. We're going to go through some of the overall updates with Darion Kendrick, the Rams losing Kyron Williams and Ronnie Rivers to injury, the two players that they signed, familiar face and Darrell Henderson, and then also Miles Gaskin. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the running back room. We'll preview the offense and both the defense for the Steelers. And we'll get into a really cool flashback that I discovered as I was researching this team from last week. And the Steelers post their bye week from 2022. And then we'll get into some mixed picks. But first and most importantly, I hope that you guys are enjoying the episodes. I hope that you guys are enjoying the product that we're putting out. So if you can, please support us as much as you possibly can. Like and subscribe and join the movement. Ram it. Like and subscribe. It is a, it's a big, big component to this podcast is your guys' support. So we greatly appreciate you all. And go Rams, obviously. Okay, so... This Steelers team is pretty fascinating. So you could do a little bit of a deep dive, but I want to start with some of the overall updates that are going on with this squad. Nick, first is the Darion Kendrick news. So obviously Darion Kendrick was arrested. Um, so he's pulled over after the game. He's facing felony gun charge. So he has possession. And then also he had possession of marijuana in the car. So um, two offenses. He was arrested. No Lay smoke. off the weed. Got to stay off the weed. But also, like, it's after a loss. You're driving around at 2.15 in the morning. Um, a little bit irresponsible. Should not happen. Hopefully, Darion gets the situation straightened out. He's a Rams player. We're rooting for his personal situation to, to work itself out. So, you know, prayers that that all, all figures itself out. Um, for the sake of this game, I do not expect Darion Kendrick to be playing. I don't expect him. Um, I mean, maybe he's on the sideline, but I don't expect him to be suited up to play the game. Um, and then there's a couple of pretty interesting replacements that we'll get into in this episode to chat through the Darion Kendrick hit. And then also, Nick, we're talking through the update with Kyron Williams. So Jeremy Fowler came out today and said that Rams running back Kyron Williams is expected to miss multiple games. Initially, it was just one week. Now it's multiple games, but should be back at the latest after the week 10 by per sources. He suffered that ankle sprain in Sunday's game. And you also saw that Ronnie Rivers has a PCL sprain. So he's expected to miss multiple weeks, expected for him to go on IR. So uh, where do you go from here? Your solutions seem to be taken pretty well by the Rams' front office. Yeah. Nick Stradamus, as some are calling me, predicting the Daryl Henderson signing. Uh, I mean, yeah, he was, uh, you know, I'm looking at my Super Bowl cup right here uh, that has his name right there. there so, you go. I mean, yeah, he, he was great. I, it was shocking that he wasn't on, on any team. I feel like he was, he's probably like realistically like, 
you know, like a cheap option for them that knows the system can come in and yep. produce immediately and knows the team, knows Stafford. I mean, they've leaned on him multiple times before. I remember that uh, the Super Bowl season uh, against Urban Myers Jaguars, he took over that entire game. And he's one of those running backs that's capable of doing so. We've seen it before. And he's still in great shape. So I'm I'm happy that, you know, I, I took the call from Les the other day. Les Snead, he was like, hey, Nick. <laughs> Should we get Daryl? And I was like, I was like, you should have done it two weeks ago, my man. But well, so uh, yeah, they got the Daryl Henderson parallels are interesting because he actually signed with the Jaguars, I think, in the practice squad in the offseason. I think he was working out with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Patriots also. But now he's back with the Rams. So to me, it, it makes a ton of sense, right? Because you're getting a guy that's kind of like a plug and play. Daryl Henderson will be able to run those, those new duo concepts. You'll be able to bring in Miles Gaskin who's a five foot 10, 200 pound running back, is a former seventh round pick, has two seasons of 40 plus receptions. So you're essentially filling both needs of Ronnie Rivers and Kyron Williams, because sometimes it's an uncertainty that Kyron Williams is going to be a sure-handed pass catcher. They wanted to use Ronnie Williams, Ronnie Rivers in some of those situations. Um, but now you have both Daryl Henderson, who could run the duo, who knows the outside zone scheme, who actually spent time. I think it was, was it in Minnesota or no, it was Miles Gaskin who spent time in Minnesota this past off season. Um, under Kevin O'Connell. So he knows the system a little bit. So I think it's two familiar faces that at least know the scheme. Um, uh, Miles Gaskin played under Brian Flores. And then I think Flores came over to Minnesota in 2023 to coach the defense. He was the head coach in, in uh, Miami. So there's parallels. I think it was a good move to be able to bring in both of these players. And I don't think it's, it, it is a reflection of a distrust on Zach Evans or Royce Freeman. I think Royce Freeman in all respects is cooked. But Zach Evans was a player that he was replaced in TCU and then he transferred over to Ole Miss and was beat out by a true freshman. So there's some legitimate context and he's not great in pass pro. Um, so I think it's a little bit more experience that he needs. You can't necessarily lean on him 20, 25 times a game. And then my other point that I really wanted to make about the offensive line, you heard Kevin Dotson, you heard Rob Havenstein, you heard Tyler Higby all vocalize how important it was to be able to establish the run and how they want that to be their identity. How could you take that away from them? Right. It's such an important unit to be able to get confidence behind. And now you finally have from week to week some continuity with Dotson at right guard with Steve Avila playing as well as he is with Alaric Jackson healthy. So you need to be able to still do those things. And with these two players, it's plug and play and you can still complement the offensive line. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I really the fact that they are bringing these guys in proves that I don't really feel like either. Evans or Freeman are developing the way that they want them to, which is what, what my takeaway from all of the past games has been with, 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 with Henderson. I'm like, you know, Ronnie Rivers, sure. And Kyron Williams has been pretty solid, but if you use somebody like, like how they use Kyron Williams, you got to expect him to be tired and then yeah, hopefully sure. not get injured, but that's what happened. You know, that's, that is the reality that we're living in is what is what I foresaw in my Nostradamus ball. So it was, it was easy for me to make the call to bring in Daryl Henderson earlier. Yeah. So the fact that we're at that point now um, makes me a little concerned about um, where I stand in the football world, because I feel like I, I <laughs> like, sometimes I'm not taken seriously when I say things like Jared Goff is an MVP quarterback. And then lo and behold, we get to this point where everything that I've been saying has been proven right. Everybody's saying I had the worst draft in fantasy. I score the most points. I don't get it. Some I, personal personal vendettas being oozed onto the podcast. Daryl Anderson should be a fantasy ad by Nick's fantasy team and amongst a lot of other fantasy users out there. So there's that. Um, I think what's really interesting about this preview, Nick, is it's Sean McVay versus Mike Tomlin. This was the last time that the two faced off against one another. Sean McVay has a boyish smile, looks about 32 years old, not a day older. And Mike Tomlin's looking at him like, dude, what the hell are you smiling at? You don't know anything about this league quite yet. So to me, I think there's such an interesting relationship between those two. Their coaching styles, Mike Tomlin's a little bit more of like, hey, you know, I got to get on you. you. You have to be better in these kind of situations, more of coaching up. And McVay is more of high spirited. You know, I, I love you. You're going to do great. Let me just kind of lean on you and you're going to do the right things. Like it's, it's a completely different kind of energy. Um, and the fact that the two haven't faced off since 2019, Nick, I think I remember back to that podcast where you and I recorded and we were like, 
Is this the moment we realize that this team isn't good enough to go to the Super Bowl again as currently constructed? Because the Steelers beat us 17 to 12 and there was no offense to be seen. Yeah. And I remembered like throughout the whole game, I was like, oh, it'll be fine. They're going to figure it out. Like, I'm not worried. You know what I mean? Like, we'll get there. They'll score that final touchdown. Game will be over. No. We'll get we'll walk away with a tough W. And then the game ends and I'm like, still waiting. I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, that, like, you know, you, you add that W to that season and then we're a playoff team again. And like, you know, who knows what yeah. happened. But it was too many of these shortcomings in a row. I think that, that division took us. Yeah, that division took us out. It was a game that we could have won. It was another game, I think, later on in the season by the Ravens that officially took us out of playoff contention. But that game wouldn't have been a must win if they would have won that game against Steelers. So good point. Um, and so the offense with the Steelers, it's obviously drastically different from what we saw in 2019. It is led by this man, Kenny Two Gloves Pickett. So I don't know what your thoughts of are of Kenny Pickett. I mean, to me, everything that I've seen so far – is he's the 18th, 19th, 20th best quarterback in the league and no better. Like it, he doesn't necessarily beat you with your legs in any scenario. He hardly ever really kind of beats you downfield with his arm. And I think a lot of the play designs that Matt Canada and, and route concepts that he rolls out are very underwhelming, lack creativity. Um, so to me, it's like this is a, le a legitimate situation to be able to put a quarterback on the ground, consistently bring pressure and hopefully get a couple of takeaways. Yeah, I mean, the thing is with the Steelers is they've had the same formula for good football since I've been born, where it's like we're going to have amazing defense. Um, you know, we're going to win 11 games with, with a crippled Big Ben somehow. Um, <laughs> for but, 10 years in a row. Yeah, for like 10 years. And it's like how is this guy even like, you know, waking up? It seems like he's got like ice packs everywhere possible uh, during the offseason. <laughs> But, like, it's it's it, it's the same thing with Kenny Pickett, and, and and it shouldn't be because he's young and he's he you know he's versatile and he can beat you with his legs. But the mm -hmm. play calling is boring, and they lull you to sleep every week. And it's like, okay, it's a third and seven. What are they going to do? They're going to run to like a like a slow Najee Harris, and they're going to punt it away. <laughs> but then their defense is going to pin you back, and they're and they're not going to let you get anything easily. And then the game's going to end with like you know, like a 12 to 17 type score. And you're going to be like, how the heck did we lose to this Patriot or the Patriots to the Steelers team? I yeah. just don't get it. So it's funny how things change, but really they stay the same. So you're hoping to see something more with a rejuvenated, you know, from 2019, like, like a younger goth now, like versus like a comparable older Stafford. And that hopefully is the difference maker in this game. Like he should be at like, Hopefully, because they're not. I feel like we're, we're neither team is going to score a lot of points. Maybe the Steelers find some holes in our defense, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to come down to Pickett versus Stafford. And I'm going to take Stafford in that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Stafford's top ten in almost every statistical category at this point. But you made some good points, and I think that, like with Kenny Pickett, he's throwing. He's yet to throw for over 240 yards in a game this season. He's at a 59.7 percent completion percentage. It's an average of 200 passing yards per game, roughly. Um, so five touchdowns and four interceptions. I, I just don't have the confidence because of the way that they start off games. Like so far, they've led an offense that starts incredibly slow. It's part that they've missed Deontay Johnson. He gets a, an incredibly high volume of targets, but they have enough other talent on this roster. So it's strange that they kind of lull you to sleep defense and special teams, but they do win in those categories. Offense just has to do a little bit of enough. It's their 13 right. first quarter drives. Nine of them have been three and out so far in five weeks, and they average eight first downs per game, which is the very worst in the NFL. But like when you look on paper, like Deontay Johnson's coming back from an injured reserve with a hamstring injury, you know, it misses six weeks in a row. And then he's back week seven against the Rams and is talking about how excited he is to play. And then there's George Pickens and Allen Robinson and Pat Fryermuth and Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Like to me, that to me on, on paper, that's enough from an offensive perspective to be able to win you football games. If Kenny Pickett isn't good enough with those type of skill players, then, you know, it's potentially on the offense coordinator to draw up some more intricate plays and to be able to get themselves in some more favorable downs and distances and extend drives, right? The three and ounce crap can't consistently happen if you're going to win nine, 10 football games in this league. And that's where they are. They're favored to win eight and a half games this year. Yeah. 
Yeah, and like right over the 500 mark, you know, because that's yeah. where they always hover. And right. yeah, I'd like, I don't know how much of a weapon Allen Robinson really ever will <laughs> be or ever was, but still, it's like you you look at the like Pickens is great, and and Pickett to Pickens is already has the connection. So I feel like, and also Najee Harris is kind of beat. I I just it's it's consistent where the Steelers just won't really rely on their offense, and they'll do enough to get them a win. Yeah. And hopefully, this is a week where they just don't find enough to do it because. There's a lot to exploit, really. I mean, like double pickings pretty much every time, honestly. Because well, then you leave DeAndre John, DeAndre uh, Deontay Johnson wide open. But that to me, the, the opposite uh, of oh, Darion Kendrick, or the opposite yeah. of 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 Akella Witherspoon, right? If Akella Witherspoon is going to lock down Deontay Johnson on a one on one opportunity, to me, I think that probably makes sense because he's been playing well against all of the top receivers that he's faced thus far. He's got a top PFF grade. I think, you know, you, you target him. He's had interceptions. He's been making plays on the ball. So he's been an impressive signing. But, like, opposite of him to me is the question mark. So do you move Kobe Durant outside? Like, do you let Duke Shelley and Trey Tomlinson own the slot? Like, to me, that matchup against George Pickens is going to be really interesting because Darion Kendrick is not on the field. So whoever is your primary target, maybe it's George Pickens in this scenario, and you get a lot of Pickens on Akella Witherspoon. But if you look opposite of that, and you go Deontay Johnson on who? You know what I mean? Where where's the direct one on one matchup? Of course they're not they're not going to be in man coverage the entire game. But I think in some scenarios, even if they are in zone, it's dependent on a one on one matchup on the outside. So I'm very very curious to see. Right, I think the Darion Kendrick news is pretty interesting to see how they, I guess, kind of divide and conquer on coverage. Yeah, yeah. I I mean honestly, everything that we've seen from Witherspoon thus far, um, outside of some some like bad penalties. I feel like it's been enough. It, it, you yeah. know, it, hasn't, it, 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 it hasn't been substantial where it's like, it's going to win you a game, but it's been enough. To me, it has been. And when they waived Sean Jolly on nine, five, and they signed Duke Shelley, who has the experience in this kind of defensive structure and can get into the nickel and star if Durant decides to move outside. To me, that's the answer, right? So it's going to be Durant and Akella Witherspoon on the outside. You have Duke Shelley in the slot, potentially on a player like Alan Robertson or, Pat Fryermuth, and you know it's not a difficult assignment, and you allow the two most talented outside cornerbacks match up on two of the most talented pass catchers in this game. So to me, I feel like that's a good way to shut them down. And then like their offensive line, it's been suspect this year when it was incredibly good all of last year. Which to me, this is the most insane statistic I've ever read about an offensive line coming off of the Rams this season last year, but. All five of their starting offensive line played all 17 games last year. <laughs> to me, that is ridiculous. Consistently, all 17 games, all starters. And now it's led by Isaac Sayamalu from Philly, who they added in the offseason, starting a left guard. And then Dan Moore Jr. sprained his MCL. So the Ravens got first-round rookie Broderick Jones, was playing left tackle in week five. And now they might go back to Dan Moore Jr. And then their center, Mason Coles, having a little bit of a down year. And Kevin Dotson who we stole from the Ravens is now playing better than both of the two players that have started at right guard for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So to me, all praise to Les Need, all praise to Kevin Dotson. He was one of the vocal offensive linemen after the, after the win against the Arizona Cardinals, the grade is 30 points higher, right? It's Kevin Dotson at 85.9 and James Daniels and Nate Herbig. So like for as good as their offensive line was last year, they're having some concerns in terms of, you know, who's going to fill in this role? Who's the better player at this position? And it, it could leave some opportunities for everybody's favorite player in Pittsburgh's own, Aaron Donald. Right. And I feel like maybe if the game was in Pitt, it'd probably be like a bigger deal. But I think he plays up for the Steelers games, you know? I think he does. There in the offseason. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just to talk a little more about the offense, they're, like the Steelers' offense, uh, statistically speaking, are the worst scoring offense in the red zone with only 28.6% of their drives ending in touchdowns. The Jets and the, and the Giants are both scoring touchdowns at a higher rate when entering the red zone, which is ridiculous because I watched Sunday Night Football where the Giants couldn't score a single touchdown to win the game, and yet somehow the Steelers are statistically worse than them. That's what I'm saying. With, the, with Matt Canada, not a ton of creativity in the pass game, not a ton of creativity in some of their red zone concepts. So that's an opportunity. If you can keep them out of the end zone, and you could score a couple of touchdowns, kick a couple of field goals. It's going to be enough to win this game, in my opinion. And then we switch over 
to the defense, which I mean, it's a Steelers defense. Like, right. I think some of the stats, like this is the one occasion, and like this usually doesn't happen. Usually, you can rely on stats. You could at least use the stats to sway your personal argument in one direction or the next. But to me, like, I genuinely believe <laughs> that none of these following stats are going to be useful for the sake of this game. But I, I think that there's some important context. Obviously, we'll talk through it all. But like every defensive stat that we're going to read to you on the Pittsburgh Steelers is overwhelmingly negative. Which right, and it, and like if you're watching Steelers games, you know that the only reason they're winning these games is because of the defense <laughs> and special teams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean it's it's so strange. So overall, the Steelers are 30th of 32 teams in total yards allowed per game. At 389.4, it's 11 touchdowns in five weeks. So say what you want coming off of a bye. We'll get into that a little bit in a second. But T.J. Watt, all-time sacks leader. I mean, one of the best edge rushers in the entire league, obviously, J.J. Watt's brother. What's the other Watt's brother's name? Do you know? Is it K.J. Watt? I think think it's just like – I feel like it wasn't an abbreviation. (laughs) I don't think it was either, but he was previously on the team. And now the Steelers have the Herbig brothers on their team. Uh, he's going to you're going to see Nick Herbig rushing the passer. You'll see Alex Highsmith, who's featured in this picture. Um, you'll get depth edge rushing from Marcus Golden and Keon Benton, who's a rookie, and then Ogan Joby also. Um, they're going to be coming after Stafford. This is one of those units to me that Derek I'm, Watt, by the way. Derek Watt is the third Watt brother. Yeah, I don't think is he still on the roster? No, I don't think. I so. didn't think. So. I, I didn't think so. So, yeah, so they decided to get rid of the Watt brothers and said we're going to employ the Herbig brothers instead. So I think um, after three weeks, they led the league in 13 sacks, uh, and they got two more in each of the next two weeks. But obviously the sample size being six weeks right now and them only having five games under their belt, you can't necessarily compare the numbers. To me, the big call out about the defense is this man is not playing, Cam Hayward. This is their identity in terms of their defensive front. If you lose TJ Watt, their entire identity is based around Cam Hayward. Cam Hayward is extremely vocal about the remainder of the roster being able to stop the run. And with a groin injury being on IR, you obviously can't do much. Um, But to me, this is a huge, huge, huge reason why a lot of the Steelers' defensive numbers are swayed in this direction, is missing a player of this caliber. Yeah. Yeah, I, and you know, I feel like we're getting some luck this year in terms of like injuries versus like other teams. Like you know, the Eagles were missing some D- DBs. Like we didn't have to face Jonathan Taylor. Um, so I don't know. It's like that's the kind of stuff that allows like a team like the Rams, who aren't really built for a Super Bowl right now, to make it into the playoffs and be really scrappy. So you know, I mean, it, you never wish for an injury from from anybody ever, but you're not going to be upset when it benefits your team. Yeah, no, they they seem like they're getting healthy, though. That's to me is the fears. Like offensively, they're getting a little bit healthier. I think progressively as they introduce some rookies into this defense, their defense is just going to get better. But against the pass, 245.6 yards per game. It's ranked 25th or seventh worst. So eight touchdown passes allowed already. And then against the run, 143.8 yards per game. They're ranked 29th or fourth worst, which is, um, I mean, that's, that's really bad. 143.8 yards per game. They got gashed by Christian McCaffrey in week one. And then Jerome Ford gashed them in week two. And then they held Josh Jacobs in week three to like 17 carries for 67 yards. So it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. And then they came back and they allowed over 100 yards on both of the next weeks to the Texans and then Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. So their rush defense, like I mentioned, is really missing a guy like Cam Hayward. Um, And then in like divisional games, that's where they – that's usually where they win, right? It's like right. being able to yeah. stop, stop the run and being able to stop the pass. So I've I've said this before where I feel like some teams legitimately are built to be atop their division and like they treat every like opponent like it's either one of those four opponents. And the Rams don't really fit into the kind of schemes that any of those other teams are really running. I think probably the closest for them would be the Bengals. Um but they haven't played the Bengals yet. So, yeah. Yeah. I, that's, it's such, it, that's why, like, they're two and It doesn't make league. sense. It really doesn't the, make any sense. The Ravens, the Browns, they have wins over, and then the, and the, the 
the Raiders. Like that's it. Right. And then but they have like a horrible loss against the 49ers and then an equally horrible loss against the Texans. Right. Yeah. It's 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 really hard to make sense of. Um, I think the one thing against the past that I wanted to mention was they're allowing a ton of yards. Part of that is due to Levi Wallace and the combination of Shandon Sullivan and Mika Fitzpatrick t- trying to defend against the slot. They're releasing Desmond King, who was previously a slot corner. And I would like to add him if Duke Shelley struggles and Darion Kendrick doesn't come back. So if they're going to get rid of him, we'll gladly take Desmond King. But Patrick Peterson, he's also getting time in the slot. Like, I think they're still legitimately trying to figure out what pieces work best in which situations. Like, when you come out of the draft, we loved Joey Porter Jr. We loved Corey Trice, like Darius Rush. These are three really good, big outside corner type rookies that can shut down top receivers. All added in the draft, only Joey Porter is, is really seeing the field at this point. Um, and Rush was a waiver claim. They lost uh, Cameron Sutton. They lost um, Devin Bush to free agency. But they brought in Patrick Peterson, as I mentioned. And their two starting linebackers are two players that they brought in from free agency and Cole Holcomb and Landon Roberts. And they're starting and playing really well. But points per game, 20, 22.0, which is ranked 20th out of 32. And um, they're also struggling to defend against the red zone. So it's so so wild you're a hundred percent right it's just like i think of them as like this amazing like run stopping team and you know i'm thinking of the games that i've like legitimately watched all the way through and there's only one outside of like highlights and that's against the raiders with, with a great comparable running back with josh jacobs so it's weird it's it's just really bizarre how and it seems like every time they win a game it's often an amazing defensive stop or like special teams like turnover or like something just really wacky i mean like i think the only reason they beat the browns is because they had like two pick sixes so it's like sure these stats are what they are but they're not counting in the amazing explosive defensive play where like yeah. you know Watt like strips the ball out and then gives it right next to another stealer it's exactly exactly right and like this is the weird aspect of it all that I wanted to flash back to last year because this was post Steelers bye week and this is mentioned all over the Steelers website specifically mentioned in Terrell Austin's bio who is the defensive coordinator for the Steelers he's currently in his second year with Steelers as a defense coordinator they improved from ranking 29th in opponent yards per game to one of the best in the entire league over the second half of 2022 season they allowed an NFL best of 272.9 yards per game following their bye week, which was number one overall in the NFL. Their defense also improved in getting off the field through the last nine weeks. They allowed the third least third down conversions in 36, and they tied for the second most interceptions with 12. The team's 20 interceptions on the season tied for the most in the entire league, all within this defensive coordinator's very first season. So previously coaching the secondary, now he's coaching the defense, and you're thinking to yourself, my God, like is this team just going to get better after the bye again, same way that they did last week? Probably. I mean, yeah, probably. And it's also just a total <laughs> like a horse hockey that we face them off a of bye and then immediately next week go into Dallas and they're coming off a of bye. It makes it that much more difficult, but the Rams are rolling. I think Matthew Stafford's playing as good as I've ever seen him play. Um, and if you can still trust the run game and Daryl Henderson is in shape, there's a lot of ifs here. And Miles Gaskin can fill the Ronnie Rivers role. Then the offense shouldn't necessarily skip a beat. I think we just want to see it balanced the way that it was in the second half of the Arizona game. I also think if you can come out this next week or these next two weeks, four and four, that's a win. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I would love to be, you know, Five and three. But sure, four but four. you go four and four heading into Green Bay. Yeah. Or Green Bay comes into SoFi this year. No, I think, I think it's Green Bay. Yeah, of course, because they never they never come to SoFi. So yeah, you could potentially win that game, and then you got to buy in week uh, week ten, and then maybe get Kyron back the week after that. So I was talking I about the head coaches that Sean McVay has doesn't have a win registered against, like head coaches that he's played. And I think it's Tomlin and Lafleur. Really? Okay. Yeah. Cool. We're both on the schedule for this year at Must Wins. Yeah. I love that. I think that I am ready for my favorite time of the week. 
You don't want to get into the Jeff Fisher uh, game from uh, 2015 <laughs> when we played the Steelers and scored like six points. 12 to six was the final score. Oh, that is the most Tomlin Fisher matchup ever. Tavon Austin had four catches for 36 yards and a fumbled punt return. That to me would be my guess on the stat line. God. No, I'm not. Don't look back at that game. Do yeah, yourself a favor. Fine. Only look forward. So, do you want to head into Nick's picks? Is that what you're I saying? Think, I, Nick, I think I'm ready. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, the thing. Yeah, hold on one second. Nick picks. <laughs> that makes me laugh every single time. I love Nine the smoke. Ready. I love the smoke. You know why? Because we take on all the smoke at Nick's picks. Nick's picks week seven. Hello and welcome to Nick's picks. Great week last week. Came in hot with lots of wins and just the one loss. Getting really close to a 500 record. Uh, still trying to climb out of that horrible week two hole. But there's a lot to like this week. And we we're going to go in with a heavily gambling hand. Dean, I actually don't – was your lock last week, Cup, any time? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Dean's locks are looking pretty good too. Some, what do you have for us this week? This one's really, really difficult. Um, you know what? I don't see. So I don't like. I don't want to go anytime touchdown score. I think I'm just going to go Rams to cover the three points and win the game. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Right. all. I love it. I love it. All right. So I like um, being favored. I think we're favored now in three straight weeks. So we go uh, Colts, and then who is week five? Eagles. Even though we were not favored in that game. So we're favored in back to back weeks. Okay. Yeah. And then okay. next week in in Dallas, it'll probably be like no. Dallas minus six. Yeah, so. not gonna be not gonna be favored there. Yeah. But all right, let's hear the new uh the new and improved Nick's Picks theme song. Welcome back. So my picks have won you some cash. Welcome back. But you probably thought that they were all trash. Well, the bros haven't changed since you hung around. But those bets are all green in your bank account. Who'd have thought they did it? Just me and Uncle Dean did. Yeah, they teased me a lot, but now my picks are hot. So welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. That was how much better welcome can it get? Welcome back. That to me was oh, the people, people have sound in. They are all saying it. it was the best one yet. Wow, and that was the one that the producers were like, "We're not going to air it. It's not ready." And sometimes when the producers say that, you just got to listen to your own gut. That was fantastic. It's between that one and uh, what was the uh, the Sopranos one? The Sopranos one. The Sopranos one went on a little too long, in my opinion. So <laughs> this was a nice, quick forty-five second or So fantastic! I'm ready. For All it. right, let's get into it. Raiders at the Bears. The Raiders are going to be four and three, and I will have no idea how. I've been essentially bad mouthing them all year, and they're going to be a flipping playoff team. Just watch. They're going up against uh, Tyson Baggett, and whose name I'm probably mispronouncing who will be getting his first NFL start. He had one interception last week, and best believe we'll probably have a couple more this week against his somehow formidable Raiders defense. Max Crosby has been Miley Cyrus circa 2016, a white wrecking ball, and dominating every pass rush. The Bears' line, offensive line, ranks in the bottom 10, so expect the Raiders to feast, feast, feast. Add to that a crumbling Bears secondary, a confident quarterback, whether it be Jimmy or backup, we don't know who's going to play yet, but I personally don't think it matters. I think his backup is on the same tier list as him. Um, and Devontae and Jacoby, I think both are just going to have a day. I'm taking Raiders minus three, 28 to 10, bloodbath of a game, easy cover. And that'll be enough to just go over 37 and a half, which I'm going to take as another play, which is the lowest of the week. So you might as well put some juice on. Cool. I like it. And then you're also taking over – 38 or 37 and a half. Yeah. As the, uh, as the second pick in this game. Over 37 and a half. I got it. Sounds good. Go. I like both. And, you know, two weeks in a row, we're, we're going to go with, we're going to run with the greatest quarterback against the spread lines at Ravens. Ravens are a little sketchy. 
they're a team with no real wide receiver one. They don't have a true identity outside of an uh, outstanding kicker. And if there's any year their division is the weakest, it's right now. And yet they're only one game above the Bengals and the Steelers, who both had horrible starts. It's really f- hard to fall in love with what you're seeing from Lamar and company. And then on the other hand, just look at the golf fans. You like so much of what you see. They have a great identity with a ton of top-tier wide receivers. Amir Ross St. Brown might be the offensive player of the year. They have multiple weapons in the air and on foot and a defense that will knock you down and stand over your limp body with apparently Waliji, which I, I talked about last week. I don't know why he's getting compared to Waliji, but we'll take it. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be like a scrap heap because I think both teams will come out a little bruised. It is in Baltimore. But the Lions look like the better team in every way except special teams. So I'm going to ride with them there. Somehow they're going to they're, they're getting points. So I'll take Lions plus three all day. I'm going 28-26. Lions take the win. Sweet. Nick, yeah. Lions at Ravens. Nick loves the Lions plus three. I like him too. Right. It's hard not to. It's really it's hard not to. Like, America's darling. Yeah, exactly. And then you got Dolphins at the Eagles. Eagles are battered. Everybody said that they were a fraudulent 5-0 team. It was proven right against the Jets. It would have been so much more sweet if we were able to prove it right, but our offense was lacking. Jalen Hurts with the biggest bonehead interception we've seen all year so far in the NFL. It's 39, and the ball goes directly into the hands of a defender. Not a remarkable grab by this defender at all. Just like right to him. Uh, there's times when you watch Hertz where he's looking like a sad puppy dog. And it's like, dude, you're the leader of the team. This is it's a ball losing. control. It's yeah, like, man. I don't want to see them cut you on the sidelines and you're all like weepy. Like you have to be the big dog. If he just throws that ball away, you pin the Jets back and your defense, who's like probably foaming at the mouth to go against Zach Wilson, who's done pretty much nothing all day. I just don't see – how this Dolphins team isn't going to put on a show towards the Eagles defense. And Hertz is going to look a little bewildered by this, by this pass rush. I also think McDaniels already looks like a better coach than Sirianni. And I'm loving everything that I'm seeing from Miami. Hmm. Uh, once again, shocked by who's the favorite here. I guess Philly does garner a lot of great fans. So it's not that shocking that Dolphins are plus two, but I love Dolphins plus two. 20 like to 34. Too. I think the Finns, Kind of destroy that one and blow it out of proportion. Eagles as a two-point favorite at home against a hot team like the Dolphins, I think to me makes sense. It's a good line. A lot of really close spreads that you're taking here. I think my favorite, I don't even know, I think it might be Lions plus three, but let's run it back. Yeah, run it back. We got Raiders minus three over 37 and a half in Ravens Bears. Um, Lions plus three. Dolphins plus two. And then my quick pick, I'm going under 44 in Rams Steelers. I just don't really see either team truly balling out as we talked about. Hopefully the Rams can win a grudge match, but I doubt it'll be by a landslide, which is why I don't want to take the Rams and the points. Um, But I think, you know, typical Tomlin, typical McVay getting in his head and probably passing too much, uh, particularly with now running backs, he probably doesn't trust as much. So I think it'll be like final score, like 20, like 15 kind of game, like exactly how it was. Rams on the right side, right? Yeah, Rams on the right side. But let's just take the under and, you know, cross our fingers. It's going to be another really interesting game. I thought Arizona had an opportunity to be an armchair game. I thought the Colts game had an opportunity to be that. It's You're not getting that this year. You're just not. They're going to win some tough games. They're going to make some mistakes. There's going to be growing pains. The coach is going to make some mistakes. But all in all, they are better than I think all of us expected. Uh, they're about right where we expected them to be. But I was going to say, that, you, I, it, it feels like they're fulfilling out the prophecy that that you actually foretold going into the season, where you were like, "I think the, you know, they should be where Seattle was last year," and it, they look exactly like that. So yeah, yeah. shout out to Dean right there. I think they could be better, but that remains to be seen. Thank you guys for listening. We love y'all. Go Rams and appreciate you until next time. Like and subscribe. Um, Send a comment. I'm not going to be Mario. So maybe that's, you know, maybe don't type Uh, Mario. I'm going to be somebody else. That was the obvious guess. That was the obvious child. Yeah. But Uh, check out the Bruce Hall. Say the Rams brothers sent us. Get some free fries on us. Check us out. We're on wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to YouTube. And thanks, guys. Horns up. Peace.
Go Rams.